when they screw you over, let them think that you are an underdog and when they are complacent, hit them where it hurts. A loving relationship forms a sacred bond of trust with a promise of commitment. When this results in lies and infidelity, this manifests heartbreak, betrayal and for some, a need for justice. In this episode, it's time for Epic Uno Reverse Cards. A wife cheated, but was tricked into publicly admitting to having the affair and herpes. A secretive woman cheats, manipulates, lies, and leaves her victim to take the blame, but it backfires. Followed by a cheating fiancé who was a no-show on the wedding to which a grandma evolved into Medusa with a mission. The last story, so majestic and horrible at the same time, a raging wife gets her husband addicted to drugs and makes him lose all in life. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. This story is about 12 years old. In college, I met the woman who I thought was the one. We dated for about two years and had a big wedding after a 10-month engagement, her family was pretty well to do in a small southern town. We were both continuing our educations and I was also working to support us. I was pursuing a master's in engineering while she was finishing her doctorate in anthropology. Over the summer, an opportunity came up for her to make some extra money going as an aide on a religious studies trip to Jamaica. I didn't hesitate when she asked me about it, I mean, she was going to get to visit Jamaica and get paid for it. I saw no downside other than missing her being at home for six weeks. Little did I know at the time, but she had been sexy timing the professor. He had hung out with us, smoked my weed and drank my freaking beer, I considered him a friend, but he was the one who arranged the trip for a couple months, it was a getaway for them to bang all over the island. I, clueless and happy, went about the weeks while she was gone taking extra shifts so I could match what she made in our account and surprise her. What a dipshit, right? One of the students from the trip actually sought me out to clue me in. I didn't believe him until I started looking for evidence on my own. I broke down and checked her texts while she was sleeping and nothing was there. There were a few audio files, so I decided to listen and there it was a message from that giant asshole saying how exciting it was that I almost caught them. I opened up her laptop and hit the emails after that, it was piles and piles of doo-doo, making fun of me for not knowing, sexy timing in our bed and laughing about it. There was so much and I was so heartbroken. Still too hurt to take any action, I was lost. I had no idea what to do, so I sat on it for a couple weeks and acted as normally as I could, I noticed everything now. I felt so stupid for not seeing it before. So many signs. One stuck out in particular. I noticed that our stash of homemade weed lube was going down even though we weren't having sex. Side tip, if you've never tried it, I highly recommend giving it a go. It was obvious they were also using the fruits of my labor to get off more effectively. This really pissed me off. Like unreasonably so, Hulk freaking mad. It finally all hit me. I was a goddamn joke to these asswipes and they were using the lube I made and sexy timing in my bed. I didn't hurt anymore, I just wanted to make them hurt. So, while she was studying at the library I made a new batch of lube. I put enough weed in it for it to smell like normal, but I also added some poison ivy from our backyard to the mixture, and after refilling the spray bottle we used for application, I waited. A few days go by and I'm working extra so I can be out of the house more, and bam, bait taken. That night after she goes to sleep my plan goes into action. I sneak her phone away and delete my contact, while replacing his phone number in his contact as mine. I go to bed but can't sleep because it feels like I'm 5 and tomorrow is Christmas. Dawn arrives and she's in the shower. I get a text. I'm super itchy are you okay? Now Lord, now is my time. I answered back. Look, I thought it had cleared up but I guess I had a flare up. I'm sorry, but I've got herpes, and I guess you do now too. I heard this cheating prince's squeak in the shower from afar. I'm covering my mouth damn near losing it. I went on to text her that it was time to end things now, a new semester was about to start and I kind of have a little crush on another teaching assistant. I wanted her mad, this is a woman that never got told no growing up, 
and never had to deal with rejection. Let alone from a balding dude in his 50s with herpes. When she got out of the shower it was obvious she had been crying but I could see the anger in her eyes. I could see how uncomfortable she was squirming at the table drinking coffee and mulling the situation over. Another little nudge is what she needed. The reply I gave her to her pages and pages of anger and sadness was, thanks for the good times, but can you keep this a secret between us, I don't want to ruin my chances with anyone else. She's flushed with anger now, just seething, she gathered her keys and headed out the door without even saying goodbye to me. The audacity of this woman. I knew where she was going. I booted up her laptop and set it to reformat, deleting her dissertation and any notes pertaining to it before following her to campus, I parked a few lots over and rush over to his office where I find her screaming at him for giving her herpes. There's lots of people there. Professors, aides, students, other faculty. I'm dying. He is beyond embarrassed and confused as frick, she is ugly crying in front of her peers, I'm in heaven. I didn't even care that people were going to think I had herpes too, it was a bliss. The fallout was apocalyptic in their department. He lost his job due to code of conduct at the university, we got divorced the following year, because state law was we had to be separated for one full year before being granted a divorce. I got to keep most of the assets, primarily savings, and not a ton, but I worked for it. She never finished her doctorate and went on to be a perpetually pregnant housewife that sells Herbalife on Facebook and he teaches high school now. It took a few years for it all to unfold, but watching it was glorious. Just glorious. In 2008, I met this amazingly awesome girl in school. Let's call her Cheetah Rita. I was 21 and she was just about to turn 19 and we both knew what love was for the first time in our lives. We were both going to a community college, me for theater design and her for education. We lived about half an hour apart but that was nothing more than a minor inconvenience because we spent every free moment between classes together. Come to think of it, that slight distance was actually pretty nice because being home at least forced us to focus on homework and taking care of ourselves, and visiting each other at home was that much more special. Cheetah Rita graduated with her associates in 2009 and moved away to a state school to finish up her degree in early childhood special education. Like before, the distance was not a concern because it was a short train ride away and I'd spend one or two weekends a month down there with her. I proposed to her on Valentine's Day 2010. School wasn't really my thing and I ended up enlisting in the USAF that following May. I got moved halfway across the country to a place neither of us had ever imagined visiting. However, like before, we wouldn't let distance get in our way. Now it should be noted that her mom did not like me. I still don't know why, but she was always the loudest, rudest, most annoying and disrespectful teabag I've ever met. She was from the city and she married into a family of farmers that owned the land since the 1870s, so that may explain part of her malice. From here on, this evil tea bag is EB. Another thing to know is that I have a great memory, and this will be important later on in the story. Anyway, back to the military. I had a two week break between my training and leaving for my first duty station, which just happened to be over Christmas and New Year's. Even though we were engaged, we hadn't really put any consideration into actually getting married. She wanted something small with her family and cousins and I was completely okay with going to a courthouse and getting it over with. I don't want to sound like I was trying to pressure her into that, but the way I saw it, I would be living in barracks in a few weeks and being married would get me a full monthly housing allowance which I would save to have a wedding ceremony when we had time in another year or two. Basically, get really married now, don't tell anyone, because they would all get hella upset for not being involved and have a fake wedding ceremony later that would include both of our families and friends. It turns out that because I was living in barracks, I wasn't allowed to collect the housing allowance, and when six months later they realized I was actually married, they would have kicked me out and made me get a house on base. Either way, we didn't get married when I was home on leave and took an Amtrak train out west. I highly recommend traveling cross-country by train if you have the time. The first time we were able to see each other after that was during her spring break, which was the first part of March. 
Cheetah Rita and I finally eloped in a courthouse and spent the next few days glued to each other sexy time style like every young married couple should. I flew back home for a couple weeks in June, and this is when things started to unravel. Easter Seals, for those who don't know, run summer camps for special needs kids, and my new wife volunteered to be a counselor for the last seven weeks of the summer. The last time I saw her that summer was just after her June birthday when I dropped her off at camp. The rest of the summer was hit or miss getting in touch with her since she was on the clock 24 hours a day for 5 days a week and I completely understood her commitment to those kids. When she was back in school the following fall she became increasingly distant, making excuses about how her phone would be randomly dead at oddly predictable times every week. She flew out to spend Christmas with me in our new house, technically a shitty, mostly empty duplex, and things felt amazing like they had been. After that, however, she went back to being super reclusive like she was the previous semester. Fast forward to May 2012. I took a whole month of leave to fly home for her graduation and to help move her in with me. I barely recognized her. Every bit of Cheetah Rita's communication with me was forced and so phony that I should have known what was really happening all along. She had set up what she called mock interviews with a couple grade schools near her hometown, and I actually believed that she was doing it just to get experience interviewing. What an idiot, when I finally started to catch on to how serious she was about getting a job in our home state, she broke down crying and made it seem like I was forcing her to choose between me and her career, and of course I wanted to put our marriage before anything else. Obviously I returned to base without her. A couple weeks later I pressured her into telling me what the hell was going on. She fell in love with one of her fellow camp counselors and let the affair go on for about 9 months, with claims that she was going to tell me but didn't know when, the usual. Too guilty to tie your own shoes bullshit, and she honestly expected me to walk away from our relationship right then and there. No. I fought tooth and nail to hold us together for 2 months before filing the divorce. I'm skipping a bunch of sappy details here but the divorce was filed late August and became final that December, mandatory 90-day waiting period in my state. The pain I suffered in that one-sided relationship is something I would never wish on anybody unless they truly deserved it. Apparently EB whispered all kinds of lies to her about how I joined the military to get away from her and actually had the gall to blame me for all the crying and misery her oldest child was going through. My soon-to-be ex never admitted who was blaming me for everything, but I was really close to her dad and siblings, so I can't imagine that they would ever suspect me. EB was so manipulative that by Halloween they had all turned against me. At that point I had it. I was near suicidal and my anxiety attacks were hitting basically every day. I was miserable, tired of being lied to, tired of the slander, tired of being the bad guy when I was the one who was attacked here. It was time for the UNO reverse card. It started with sending texts to her brothers and sister saying, Hey, I'm actually your brother-in-law. Nice to know that we don't keep secrets, right? Cheetah Rita exploded, but that was just the beginning. I wrote a 3000 word letter explaining in every detail I could recall exactly what happened, the fact that we were married, including copies of the marriage license and certificate. I added our plans for the future and how I was the only one living up to our expectations, where she met the guy she was sexy timing behind my back, his name, address, phone number and camp counselor name. This way, Cheetah Rita would have a harder time refuting it, and a bunch of other information that she made me keep secret from them. I sent copies to everyone in her extended family. Well, everyone I had an address of, this included her roommates, the summer camp she worked at, close professors she had brought up in old conversations. I couldn't be so rude to forget the principal of the school she ended up working at. Calling the fallout catastrophic is an understatement. Her super devout Catholic family basically disowned her, her reputation at her former school was shattered and the tension at her new job was apparently high enough that Cheetah Rita was forced to resign from her position before Christmas break started. Getting those secrets off my chest was the most cathartic moment of my life. My boyfriend and I were together for 9 years, on our 7th anniversary he proposed and I said yes. But we decided that we'd get married after 2 years so we'd have time to save up enough for the wedding, our future kids etc. Our families we ecstatic except for his mother. Let's call her Toxica as in toxic human being. 
I don't know why but she never liked me since day one and she was not shy in showing it. She would incessantly accuse me of being a whore, but mainly being a gold digger. I'm not trying to brag but I earn more than her son and I came from a well-off and respected family in our community. This will be important later on. Whilst preparing for the wedding, his mom took pleasure in being a goddamn pain in the butt. Toxico would make changes about the details of the wedding without informing me or her precious boy. Such as informing my guests that their invitations were revoked to accommodate her chosen guest, whom I've never met or heard about before. Mess with the seating arrangements, and change the menu and arrangements etc. I had to pay twice, literally twice just to revert the changes she made. Of course, it did not sit well with her, so being the ever mature adult that she is, she cried and threw a tantrum, a freaking tantrum. I am not a confrontational person and I easily get anxious when I feel tension arise. Thank God my fiancé's grandparents, from his father's side, were really lovely people and of course my beautiful grandma, they were the main reason why I was able to put up with all the bullshit she was doing. Belittling was one of Toxica's hobbies, so it did not come as a surprise when she berated me about my wedding dress, which was gorgeous by the way, and it was handmade by my mom's best friend, who's like my second mother. It took a year and three months to finish the dress. In short, the dress was really special to me. I never ever raised my voice nor said anything negative about Toxica, but the straw that broke the camel's back was when she stole my wedding dress two months before the wedding and destroyed it because she didn't like design. I had a full-on anxiety attack when I found about what she'd done, and whilst my anxiety attack she never lifted a finger to help, she was on her usual routine, calling my anxiety attack as a cry for attention and that I was just being overdramatic. It was too late to fix the dress so I ended up buying a new wedding dress. By this time we were way over our budget for the wedding because of this monster. Wedding day comes, lo and behold my dashing fiancé was a no-show. No one knew where he was and no one could reach him. I was devastated, and a crying mess. And of course, Toxica thought it was a perfect opportunity to verbally attack and mock me. To be honest, it still hurts me every time I remember this, up to this day I honestly believe nothing will ever make me feel so pathetic. I showed up to work the following day, desperately trying to distract myself from all the fiasco. And three days after, I found out that he had been cheating on me for a year with a mutual friend. The worst part was we all worked at the same place. As I said, I am not a confrontational person, so I did my best to avoid them and avoid the drama, but this mutual friend he was cheating with, let's call her troll. Troll started tormenting me by purposely showing off how sweet my ex-fiancé was, how he treats her like a princess, topped with nauseating public display of affection, and was spreading rumors and talking doo-doo about me just to get me riled up but it didn't work. Troll with the help of Toxica started targeting my family, as I mentioned my family is well respected in our community, and everyone knew what went down between us, so some of our close friends informed us about Toxica's malicious comments about our family. Of course, my ex-fiancé being the ever spineless bitch he is, did nothing and sided with his new troll-faced hoe. I am really close with my grandma, she was the one who raised me when both my parents died. I love and respect the woman, she is an epitome of what a classy woman is. She has this aura that was really kind and comforting but can be very intimidating when the situation calls for it, which is why she is well respected and well loved in our community. She always had a smile on her face and treated everyone well. And if it wasn't for her I don't think I would make it after all that had happened to me. So when Toxica started badmouthing her, I was hellbent on destroying her and my spineless ex-fiancé. I was beyond furious at this point, thus I started scheming on how I planned to drag them down. I talked to my grandma about it, but she convinced me not to do so and that I should just leave our hometown for a while to take a breather and take some time to heal myself etc. After weeks and weeks of discussions and I eventually saw how everything that had happened and currently happening was taking a toll on my mental and emotional health, I conceded defeat to my grandma's idea. So I left, didn't contact anyone from the hometown except my grandma. Two years passed, and I received an invitation for our high school reunion. By this time, I've been really missing my friends and family so I decided that it was high time to return and reconnect with my old friends and family. Everyone was surprised to see me, but everyone was really warm and welcoming, 
it certainly felt like I was back home. Everything was going well. I was in line to get a refill of my drink when I overheard two girls blabbering about how Troll was pregnant and the father of the child was a married man. I was curious as hell, but decided not to pry about since I no longer want to be on the loop about whatever was going on about them. The following day, I met up with my favorite cousin, and my curiosity got the best of me, so I asked him about what went on when I left. And oh boy, I was not ready for the tea. My grandma always had a gleeful disposition, she always greeted everyone and engaged in small talks with anyone. But apparently, when I left she started to act differently. The happy grandma from the next door was gone, she always had a gloomy smile, even the way she talks changed. She talked about how bad she felt for me, how she was hurting so much that me her precious granddaughter was going through such a rough time. How it broke her heart knowing that she couldn't do anything to ease my pain. People around us knew grandma as someone who hates to be seen as weak and helpless, thus it was truly a heartbreaking surprise when they saw grandma at such state. Despite her lamenting about my unfortunate situation, she had nothing but kind words for my ex fiance Toxica, and Troll. Everyone revered me and my grandma for handling the situation ever so gracefully, their words not mine, despite all the bad blood, we took the high road. People now started treating ex fiance and Toxica differently, they became a social pariahs. After hearing what both ex fiance and Toxica did and how they treated me, especially Toxica, most family members cut their ties with them. Toxica's husband, a good man, but very timid, apparently was my grandma's student, filed for a divorce and declared that Toxica could have whatever she wanted for the marriage as long as he doesn't have to deal with her anymore. As for the spineless ex fiance, most of our mutual friends sided with me through the ordeal. Ex fiance was being groomed to be promoted for a takeover as the department chief, and this was huge because if it went through, ex fiance would be the youngest chief in the company's history, but due to what had happened and the fact that his boss, my second mom's husband, was a close family friend of ours, it all went down the drain. Ex fiance was not fired from his job because boss thought it would be such an easy way out and because my grandma spoke to boss that firing ex-fiancé would be wrong and unprofessional and again playing her sweet old lady card. Troll was caught having an affair with her boss, unfortunately this boss of hers was married. The wife found out about the affair but didn't know who the third party was. Obviously, divorce papers were filed, and both parties agreed that it was a no-fault divorce. Until, the wife received incriminating evidences of both Troll and the boss which were sent anonymously. Grandma hired a private investigator to collect enough evidence to incriminate both Troll and the cheating boss. Not only did the wife sue for 80% of their property, but she also filed case to have Troll's license to be revoked on grounds of moral turpitude. As the investigation went on, they found out that Troll and her cheating boss had been stealing from the company. One thing people did not know about my grandma is that, she's really conniving. She knows how to play that sweet lady card all too well. My grandma likes to share a little advice with you all, when someone screws you over, let them think that you are an underdog and when they are complacent, hit them where it hurts. I needed to go into DC for a couple hours yesterday afternoon to tie a few things up at work before leaving for vacation. I didn't leave until a bit afternoon so I was pretty hungry and decided to stop at this nice little deli slash grocery store on the way for a sub. It's a small establishment but pretty popular. The parking lot is kind of weird, the spaces are on the small side and it's very narrow. I drive a full-size truck because I have to tow heavy stuff often. I spot a corner space that's going to be easy for me to get in and out of so I go for it. I back in partially and then pull out to straighten it up and a lady swoops in my space in a little Fiat. I put my truck in park and look back through the window, she was on the phone. When I gave a little honk, she looked up and gave me the finger. I gave her a slow shaking head and a thumbs down, I don't know why, but that gesture seems more impactful to me. Like disappointment versus anger. I found myself another spot and started making my way to the deli. The angry lady was still engaged in her conversation and is now behind me walking to the deli. She's talking loudly on her phone about the redneck that almost wrecked her car in the parking lot, trying to gain sympathy from whomever she was speaking to like I goddamn tried to assault her with my vehicle. So, 
as I'm in the line to take a number to be served, it clicks, I can frick with her a little bit today. I reach up to take my number, and pull the next 10, tucking them in as I turned around so angry lady didn't see them. I make my way down the line passing out the numbers ahead of hers and mine. Putting 10 people ahead of us to order and receive food. Making her wait an extra 20 or so before she got even got to order. Here's where it gets a little fun. My number was directly before hers, so I just waited at the counter after they called mine. As the girl walked up with the next sub, I asked if it was number 469, this was angry lady's order, the girl nodded and I bought both subs, so the deli never called her number. I don't know how long she waited before she asked about her order. I do hope she wasn't an asshole to the workers though. The second part of this is what I did with the extra sub. Part of that is being kind to strangers. I work in DC, there are a ridiculous amount of homeless people here so I pack an extra lunch a few days a week to eat with some random person. The extra sub was gonna be my lunch date with whoever I ran into that looked like they needed a meal after I parked my truck. I found my overpriced parking spot quickly and grabbed the sandwiches and a couple bottles of water before making the ride towards work. I spotted a guy sitting on a bench with a little sign asking for change. I asked him if he'd like to have lunch with me. His eyes lit up and he shook his head yes. We had a little causal conversation and he asked me why I bought him a sandwich, I told him that oddly enough I bought it out of spite and told him how I came into ownership of the food. He laughed, said it was fate that revenge brought him a sandwich and proceeded to tell me the following story that led him to the life he now lives. He was a young investment banker in the late 90s making serious money. He was married and had a sex addiction. He would spend thousands of dollars on high dollar hookers to do all kinds of weird shit to him. He eventually got himself a sugar baby and set her up with an apartment in the city. He had no interest in children but his wife did, so he got a secret vasectomy. Thinking that he was only going to be sexy timing two people now, he liked the idea of no condoms or babies at either house. His plan was to stay at the apartment for a couple weeks to heal while his wife thought he was in San Francisco for business. Unfortunately for him, his urologist's office called his home line to check in after a couple days. This is when his wife started to learn of all his illicit behavior. The cheating, the spending, the stealing of her future family. Over the weeks he was gone, she uncovered his secrets to her. And she sat on it. He told me in the weeks and months after his vasectomy, she started wanting to go out, get drunk, experiment with drugs and group sex. He was amazed at how much he and her were in sync now. He loved their newfound lifestyle. He really loved the cocaine. So much that he had to evict his sugar baby from the 7-8k he was spending a month on blow. He couldn't handle the expense anymore along with his habit. Luckily, his wife was still ride or die with the swinging, snorting life they had built, so he was going to be okay. And she was, going along with every fantasy recruiting men and women to have sexy time with. She kept building up this fantasy of having a threesome with his boss's wife. Whispering things in his ear when they were having sexy time. Just really putting her at the forefront of his thoughts. Christmas party time rolls around and the whole staff is wasted. She keeps at him about the forbidden kitten. The boss's wife goes to the restroom and his wife follows her. After a few minutes they come out and the boss's wife waves at him. As his wife approaches, she tells him that she's down to swap and that's why she waved. Next time she goes to the restroom he should just follow her in. She kept him at her side and fluffed until she sent him gleefully trailing behind his superior's wife into the restroom. No, that is not at all what she was waving for. Wifey had said that he didn't think she had seen him all night and a wave would make him feel better. He exposed himself and said he couldn't wait to taste what her husband left in his wife. After the scream and slap, the party halted. The next day he was fired and subsequently blackballed from his industry. His cocaine habit sucked what little finances he had left after the divorce. He couldn't keep a job after his life fell apart. He's now homeless, and has given sexy time acts for a warm place to sleep and a meal, no, not for this meal. Also, karma already got me for the angry lady at lunch. I walked in on my Nana having sexy time in a hot tub last night thinking that the sounds were someone in trouble.
Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe or give me some sugar by smashing the like button. Royal AI would love to hear your experience or what you think of these stories in the comment section.